So as many of you know, as an enlightened centrist, I've transcended all political labels and political beliefs, which means I am much more interested in ideas than I am labels, of course. So if someone calls themselves a socialist, you might say, oh, this person's a moron. And there are absolutely a large number of people where you'd be right on. However, the current world we live in, call that capitalism, has a lot of flaws. Eric Weinstein talks about the embedded growth obligation, for example, the fact that our markets are set up for infinite growth, which is inherently destructive, all of that. So I think it's important to listen to people who are socialists and see what their good ideas are. Because, for example, there's people that call themselves market socialists. And based on everything I've heard, that's pretty much just like a smarter version of capitalism. So there's room here. OK, and so we're going to do socialism for absolute beginners. And we're going to we're going to learn and we're going to see if we can develop a comprehensive economic ideology. Here we go. This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. My AdSense revenue has completely tanked in the last couple months. Oh! So if you'd like to help support this channel and get a bunch of cool perks while you're at it, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Starting off hot. Socialists starting off hot. Asking for money. I know that's a joke. It's a joke. We still live in a society. You can't not have money, even if you're a socialist. Just making a joke. Calm down. According to a new survey, 70% of American millennials say they'll likely vote socialist, and one in three of them view communism favorably. That's why I have to do this video, because if that many people are buying into something that many people would say, oh, well, socialism is self-evidently dumb. Like, okay, there's a lot of people that buy into it, and unless your theory is that a lot of people are stupid or indoctrinated, which a lot of, certainly a lot of people are stupid and indoctrinated, but there's a lot of reasonable people who would buy into it too. So let's try and understand what would be reasonable from the socialist perspective. The term socialist has been gaining traction for the past couple of years. Let's get started. The central idea that unites all socialists is maximizing freedom for everyone, regardless of who they are. Generally speaking, socialists want people to have the kinds of rights that ensure they have that freedom. That's interesting because maximizing freedom is not something I'm actually, I don't think that's a good thing. I think a lot of freedom should be, I think meaning should be maximized, but that's a different thing from freedom because this is a hyper libertarian idea. You know, people talk about like, oh, super individualism, super like libertarianism. Conservative morality about how like you should start a family, you should do what's good for society. That puts freedom beneath like responsibility. Very interesting because we always associate conservative morality with, or we, so, we associate like communism and community orientation with left-wing orientation and individualism with right-wing, but mor the morality is switched. What do conservatives say? Start a family, get a job, contribute to society. And the left-wing people say, I'll do what I want. I can live my life in any way I want, and I don't need all these norms, these oppressive gender roles. I'm a hyper-individual. So it's interesting because the maximizing freedom thing, I'm not sure I buy that. Freedom is good, but maximizing freedom ad infinitum just creates atomization. But it's not enough that these rights exist on paper. People need to be able to exercise them. If you have the freedom to an education, but can't afford to spend even one hour less on the job to go to class, then you don't really have the freedom to an education. The law says you do, but you're not actually free to enjoy it. Think about it like this. We might have missed out on a thousand Einsteins because poverty kept them from achieving their full potential. True. Having freedom and the actual ability to exercise it is critical. And this Agreed. central concern with freedom isn't very surprising. Every political theory wants to maximize or guarantee freedom in some way. If the US had its own ideology, Americanism or something, its advocates would also say it's all about freedom. And to be fair, capitalism did after all become the way of life for most people around the world, at least in part because it allowed some people to be more free than they had been before. Sure. Because before capitalism, there was something else. Feudalism. Capitalism was born. And we can see how this new system works today. Under a capitalist society, yeah, your is. boss is part of this new group of free people. He, like the nobility of the previous economic era, has a lot of freedom to do what he wants, and a lot of the decisions he makes for himself trickle down and ultimately affect you. I like how he's phrasing, your boss has a lot. It's like, well, you... you you also have a lot of freedom too. If you're able to spend 25 minutes of your life to sit down and watch a YouTube video about socialism, you probably have a decent amount. You probably have a, at least some minimum threshold of freedom and quality of life that far exceeds for many people in the world who live absolutely terrible lives. So it's, a, it's interesting the framing is already set up this way. In the relationship between the two of you, it's ultimately him that has the power. For example, your paycheck isn't determined by how good a job you do, but by what your boss decides it to be. He has that freedom. Directly what? or indirectly, your boss hires and fires who he wants. You work for him. Your paycheck is not determined by, what did he say? Paycheck isn't determined by how good a job you do, but by what your boss decides it to be. What if you're a salesperson on commission? It's literally that. And also the better job you do, the more productive you are for the company and the more incentive they have to pay you. Interesting. He has that freedom. Directly or indirectly, your boss hires and fires who he wants. You work for him and spend your days producing something that he can turn around and sell to someone else. This allows him to make a profit. Regardless of whether he's a nice guy or not, his profit calculation will demand that he take into account a few things. 
like how much he needs you and how many people out there are gunning for your job. True. The more those people are desperate, for example, because without your job, they might end up homeless, the more he can push your wage down. The more homelessness or poverty True. there is, therefore, the better it is for him. Your salary isn't determined by how dedicated you are or how valuable what you do is, but by how disposable you can be. You can get up and protest him <laughs> messing with your paycheck like this, but in the back of your mind, you know that if you push back too hard, you risk ending up with everyone else who was fighting to get your job. Okay, look, I, like I think it's screwed up that your medical insurance is often tied to your place of work. Here's an example. Let's say you're anti what this guy has to say kind of right wing. Imagine your company goes very woke and they start requiring you to do all these DEI trainings. Well, because they have your paycheck over your head, they hold it over your head and your medical insurance, for example, they can create ideological conformity that you otherwise wouldn't buy into it. So I get that, like there are valid issues with giving businesses power over its employees, for sure. Let's see what the solutions are. People were made to work the nobles land and hand over the product of their labor. They had no choice and very little freedom to do otherwise. You work the land or you're gonna be in a world of hurt. Now, you need to work the corporate, industrial, or service industry gig and hand over your time and whatever you produce while you're on the clock to the capitalist. In theory, you have the freedom not to work, or to work for whomever you want, as well as to negotiate with your employer. But in the same way serfs needed a place to live and food to put on their table, money from employment in the capitalist industry is necessary to live. And it's- Yeah, that's like, well, you know, people in the past, they needed food to live. And nowadays, you still need food to live. It's like, yes, that's just- the reality of life. I think I saw a meme where it was like socialist. Every time they critique capitalism, just replace capitalism with the human condition and you'll get the same response. It's like, yep, that's basically what, what it seems like. Like, can you believe in a capitalist society? You need to work to survive. Oh, you mean we live in the reality of the universe as it has existed for 6 billion years? It's not like the power is balanced between the two of you. Not long ago, during the dawn of this new economic system, most workers had to hand over the majority of their life, 12 hours a day, six days a week, to their employers, often from a young age and in unspeakable conditions. We only very recently made this somewhat more bearable. The reason we haven't made even more improvements today is that capitalism did not actually represent much of a fundamental change from feudalism. The relationship of domination and coercion isn't all that different. It's just that this time, the size of the group with freedom is slightly bigger, a couple thousand instead of a couple hundred. And you don't necessarily have to be born into it. This system, for all its flaws, hasn't been all bad. In general, living standards yeah. have improved there under capitalism for a lot of people. Capitalism is a net improvement in some ways from the society that preceded it. But just like feudal society became outdated, so too has capitalism. Mm, I, there have always been problems with this narrative of rising living standards. But recently, capitalism has started to fail even the people who once got a decent shake out of it. Two or three generations ago, it was a no-brainer that a job could get you a house and enough money to support a family, pay your way through college, and get access to healthcare. You weren't exactly free, but you weren't doing too badly either. That is no longer true. The few people at the top have been given so much freedom to keep the money you made for them by working in their offices, at their storefronts, and in their factories that there isn't much left for you. High school and college graduates, once guaranteed stable employment and livable wages, are losing out. Nowadays, between 40 and 50% of college grads are unemployed or working in a job that doesn't require a diploma. In I 100% agree that the single biggest example of the excess and parasitism of capitalism is the university industrial complex. The absolute lie that people are told that in order to be successful in life, you need to get a college degree. Bullshit. You're far more likely to be successful if you get a trade. I would recommend no one go to college and instead go to trade school because there's like a 30% chance that when you go to college, you come out stupider than you were before. If you get an English degree or a gender studies degree or many other degrees that have absolutely no contact with real life. Now, of course, it's a terrible, no wonder all these people are coming out not getting a job. It's like, what did you learn in gender studies that translates over to a need in society? Well, oh, we can be diversity officers. Oh, okay. Well, you're the reason why college tuition has expanded expanded to that degree because colleges have to pay your salaries and therefore loans have to be taken out on the part of the people who are going to college to have to pay your salaries. You put them in debt. So yeah, that's the reason I'm very sympathetic to socialists, one of many, because they accurately point out craziest example, parasitic capitalism, the university industrial complex. Indebted at rates that completely overshadow their salaries. And the story is the same across the economy. For someone working at Amazon to make as much money as Jeff Bezos does in just one year, they would have to work for 58 years. And that's just with his salary. If we start counting dividends, you'd be working every day of every year of multiple lifetimes just to catch up to Bezos' single lap around the sun. Clearly, it's time for an upgrade. Socialists look at this march of history and ask two questions. One, is there a better way to get the same results as produced under capitalism? Mm -hmm. And two, what is it? In other words, how do we keep the parts we like from capitalism, rising living standards, and cut out the parts we don't like, the exploitation, imbalances of power, and massively uneven distribution of those rising living standards? 
The big answer for socialists lies in who owns things like companies. The argument goes that so long as there is just one, or at the most a few people who own our society's productive enterprises, they will be able to make decisions that benefit them and not us. Sure. Your boss, because he has been given the freedom to do so, will use his power to curtail yours. He will always try to push your wages down. That's so... That does not reflect my lived experience. Now, of course, I have an incredible amount of privilege. That word has been abused, but I, in the real sense, have an incredible amount of privilege. But the idea that, like, your boss will do everything in his power to curtail your freedom, it's like, or a boss who is interested in having productive employees because you need employees to be able to make money is interested in keeping their employees happy. And in fact, most of the successful companies often have very comprehensive and sophisticated employee support programs, right? And they may not be perfect and they may not, there's all kinds of examples where they're not, but like, it is conducive to profit to keep happy, productive employees that stick around for a long time. Because the longer that your employee has been part of your company, the more productive they are because they know all the ins and outs and how you do things. So it's just like, this is just, that part is, yeah, cynical. Exactly. And I think it's absolutely true in certain places. I've worked in hell holes, one hell hole in particular in a, in a, at a bar. So that's true. But it's certainly not true on a large scale. And I don't know if it's true enough on a large enough scale for this to be an overarching critique. As low as possible. Make you work the longest hours you can. Make your working conditions as dire as possible. Because it's cheaper that way and rakes in more money for him and the other people who own the company. While he has to balance that with what other capitalists will do and try to offer better conditions, hours, or wages, every step he makes in the right direction has to contend with his profit margins. If something is unprofitable, even just by a fraction of a percent less, he can't do it. He can't risk some other company being more ruthless than he is and undercutting his business. The only choices that are on the table are the ones that make him wealthier, even if that means making you poorer or generally worse off in the process. Socialists take stock of all these incentives and try to understand how we can change them. Instead of the most important thing being the capitalist profit, how can we incentivize things that benefit all of us? Mm -hmm. Putting more options on the table than just the ones that make the guy at the top richer. That's, I and like we that. have a lot of ideas on how we can do this, from central planning, to free association between communes, to worker-owned cooperatives, to cybernetic management. However oh, varied these what? ideas are, and truly there are a lot of them, they are all united by the same conclusion. That the best way to figure out which ideas benefit everybody to the fullest extent is to let people decide for themselves. Give everybody control over what ideas we want to see happen and how. Sure. Instead of a few people at the top setting the rules of the game, everybody should get a say over things like their working conditions. Control over what gets done and how for everyone by everyone. Not by some self-appointed class of millionaires and billionaires who get to boss everyone else around. And you intuitively know that this works. How many times has your boss made a decision you know is in the wrong, but you're the one who has to live with it? How many times have you been told that there's just not enough in the budget for a raise or for you to take that day off? But the company is raking in record profits. How many decisions are... So here's one of the interesting problems is like, okay, his point is companies are profit driven animals that will do everything in their power to, to not spend any more money than they have to. It's like, okay, imagine a company that has a CEO that gets paid $5 million a year. If that CEO was not worth the $5 million a year that they pay him, wouldn't the company have every single incentive to fire that CEO? The board of directors who's operating on behalf of the shareholders would want to fire that CEO because he's not producing the value that they pay him. And it's a lot of money that they pay him. So either it's more complicated than what he's laying out here or what the CEO, it's like the CEO, it's just colluding or whatever. It's like CEOs get fired all the time and on bad terms. If you actually like pay attention to business news, which I suspect this person doesn't. Because why would you need to pay attention to what goes on in the business of capitalism if you've already come to the conclusion it's all worthless? Kept behind closed doors until they blow up in your face. You might not always have the answers to every problem your company faces, but if the solutions of those at the top are so good, why are their decisions made behind closed doors? Why do they always make them better off and not you? So what are you talking about? Why, why do they make them better off and not you? It's like, well, sometimes if you work at a company, Sometimes the management does make good decisions. Like, hey, we, ins we, we bought this new software that makes everyone's jobs easier. Congrats. That was a good decision. So again, this is very ideological, right? Hard to take everything this guy says seriously, but we're still going to give him a chance. Socialists understand that this isn't a system that makes anybody more free or makes things any more fair. Freedom is a two-way street. I can't be free to do what I want if you have the freedom to stop me from doing it. I can't be free if you make all my decisions for me. By all means, when something only affects you, you should be able to do what you please. But if things like my livelihood get involved, it's only fair that we all get a say. And it's becoming clearer to more people growing up today that their odds of living a decent life aren't as secure as they have been in the past. 
it's going to come down to a lot of luck whether you end up doing well for yourself and living what we might consider a normal life, even if you work really hard. True. But even though we see how our current capitalist society is leading us down this unfortunate path, curtailing our freedom, or more generally, how the system benefits from things like high unemployment, poverty, and low wages, it can feel scary or even just hasty to jump to socialism for the answer. We can recognize the flawed incentives and inherent economic instability of capitalism and still not know what to do about it. Mm. The historical record, after all, hasn't really proved that an alternative system works either. Mm. At least, that's what we've been told. Oh. But contrary to what is commonly believed, the performance of developing countries in the period of state-led development was superior to what they've achieved during the subsequent period of market-oriented reform. Really? There were some spectacular failures of state intervention, but most of these countries grew much faster, with more equitable income distribution and far fewer economic crises during the bad old days than they have done in the period of market-oriented reform. I... I... If he does not pull up examples, I might have to end the video right here, but let's see. Moreover, it is also not true that almost all rich countries have become rich through free market policies. The truth is more or less the opposite. With only a few exceptions, all of today's rich countries, including Britain and the US, the supposed homes of free trade and free market, have become rich through the combinations of protectionism, subsidies, and other policies that today they advise developing countries not to adopt. Free market policies have made few countries rich so far and will make few rich in the future. That's a quote from economist Ha Jun Chang in his book 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. There's more interesting stuff in there and it's a pretty casual read if you're interested. And he's not even a socialist, so you don't have to worry about consuming commie propaganda or anything. He's just honest about the shortcomings of capitalism. So what does this mean? Is socialism just- So the claim was that- what was the claim? Contrary to what is commonly believed, the performance of developing countries in the period of state-led development was superior to what they've achieved during the subsequent periods of market- market-oriented reform. I'd love an example because I'm pretty sure every country implementing state-led policy, central planning in history has been a failure. The single biggest ideology that has destroyed Africa is Marxism because a lot of those countries develop their economic policies based on central planning and whatnot that caused mass starvation and all kinds of destruction. And then you take a country like Botswana, which is the opposite of that, which had very free market policies, kind of individualism oriented. And I think Botswana is like one of the least corrupt countries in the world today. So when people tell Talk about like European colonialism destroying Africa. It's like, yes, Marxism, biggest factor of that, because that ideology infested those countries, caused massive disputes. So there's no example here. I find it very hard to believe. I could be wrong. I'd love to understand more. But my understanding is absolutely that's not the case. There's not been a single instance of central planning working. The argument that socialists make, the compelling one, would be, well, now with like AI and new technology, central planning was not feasible before, but now it is more so. Okay, maybe that's a little bit more compelling, but I don't think any serious person says historically central planning and socialism has had a good effect. What does this mean? Is socialism just when the government does stuff? The answer is no. For starters, that question implies a lot of really horrible things. You think the DMV sucks? Just wait until the government takes over everything else. You think the government is screwing you now? Just wait until they have even more power. Obviously, a world of DMVs as dictators isn't what socialists want. Who in their right <laughs> mind would defend something like that? that? Part of the problem is that that question is being asked in a pretty deceitful way. What counts as the government doing stuff? Mm. Sometimes government programs are measures for wealth redistribution, like social security, welfare, public libraries, and food stamps. Other times, it's basic stuff that every government, regardless of its economic model or ideology, takes care of. Things like fire departments, garbage removal, sewers, or streetlights. In this list are also institutions like the police, the military, the FBI and CIA, courts, and prisons. Wherever you are on the political spectrum, there are going to be things on this list that you don't like and other things that you do. Sure. When you imply that socialism is when the government does stuff, and you're already primed to be wary of the word, your mind easily jumps to whatever thing the government does that you don't like, or that the present government does the worst, hence the DMV and authoritarian Interesting. stuff. Interesting. Availability bias. That's not True. what socialism is. Bias. Socialism is a society in which the means of production, factories, farms, offices, basically the things that produce for the economy, are held by all in common and subject to democratic decision making, rather than that of a few individuals. Nothing more. While governments are one way to coordinate this ownership, it's not the only one. What's more, there's a deeper problem with this question. Wait. The way we think of government isn't absolute, empty of all context. As humans, we have a hard time imagining a world that isn't like the one we have now, which means we also have a hard time imagining how our governments could be different from the way they exist today, under capitalism. And you already know what that's like. Companies pumping in billions to get some guy elected and in their pocket. Public services working on razor-thin budgets and being genuinely Unions too, pumping billions, just if you're going to be honest here, it's corporations and unions. And I think the single biggest organizations that pay money to political campaigns, I believe are unions, could be wrong. It's certainly equivalent at minimum, roughly equivalent. Really infuriating. The people you cast a ballot for not doing their jobs and getting paid quite a lot to pretend it's not their fault. Every election going to the lesser evil. The default vision of government we all no inherit problem. is one of incompetence, unresponsiveness, corruption, and elitism. It benefits a select class of one percenters and only tosses a few crumbs to the rest of us. The main promise that socialists have to keep is that we can turn this all on its head. 
that we can truly arrive at democracy, one that isn't awful and out of touch, by directly involving people in the democratic process at their job Inspiring and stripping all the power the away from the billionaires that sit at the helm of massive corporations with the power to lobby democracy away. That we can coordinate, through planning or otherwise, the production of things in such a way that we are producing according to our needs and desires, not for the profit of a select few. Profit-driven markets sometimes get this right, in all fairness, you know, broken clock and all that, but are still very often <laughs> terrible at delivering on our wants and needs. Hence why housing is so unaffordable for most people. Bro, has this man been to a grocery store? Do you understand the complexity and the absolute miracle that it is to have virtually every person, not all, but virtually every person in America within like a five mile radius of a grocery store that is virtually all the time, not always, but virtually all the time filled with food. The incredible coordination problem to get eggs that have to make it from the chicken's orifice all the way to your, to the, to the fridge in the grocery store. Unbroken. That's an, that's, and then what is it like $3? Broccoli is like a dollar a pound. So the, the majority of human history and in many places still in the world, people starve all the time. And I can, most people can go to the grocery store and buy pounds of vegetables. Pork chops are generally cheap. You might not be able to afford steak all the time, but like pork chops and chicken breast and broccoli. And it's relatively inexpensive. So just like it's funny how he pointed out when people think of government, they immediately think of the thing they dislike. But you have to understand that government does good stuff too. It's like, okay, what did you just do with capitalism? Well, when you think of capitalism, housing's unaffordable. It's like, yeah, okay, but food, you, you virtually no one starves in America, but we just take that for granted. We can't for sure know if things would have happened differently if by some accident of history, socialism had become our global economic model all those years ago when capitalism was born. Maybe. But we can still try to imagine what we can do from this point forward. There's no doubt that this video won't have answered all your questions. Imagining a different world is a tedious thing to do, and there are a lot of concerns to be addressed. And it's also usually easier to ask questions about something in the future than turn around and ask those same questions about the system we have right now. If we were as critical with our present society as we are with that of the future, would we still choose it? In any case, I put a link below to a short pamphlet put together by Verso and Jacobin Magazine. Most questions people have when first encountering socialist theory are answered in a few short conversational pages. There's Well, should we like or dislike the video? We're not going to do either. Okay. It was a good attempt on his part. All right. Good attempt. I don't think this person's a bad person. Right? I just disagree with a lot of what he put forward.